Well, hello there, all you lovely ladies and gents in podcast land, more like Patreon land, because you know what this is? This is a exclusive episode of the VHS Boy just for my patron people. Now, isn't that special? Isn't that something pretty special and cute, you know? That's what, you know, at September uh, 28th, 2020, that's what you all need. That's what's going to fulfill your soul and, and bring you out of the depths of despair from all the chaos in this country and world, you know? But hey, in all seriousness, you are going to be okay. No matter what happens. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of darkness and uncertainty. There is a lot of uh, upheaval, social decay. There is anger and fury and confusion. And listen, you must connect with the light that brings you joy, that, that reminds you of who you are and what you're contributing to this world and of everything beautiful and good and peaceful that says, even if there is suffering, even if there is um, darkness and difficulty, you will be all right. Not where I meant to begin, but, and hey, and hey, you're getting full quality audio on this, you know? This is not this is not straight to IG. This is not just little microphone or I mean uh, you know phone camera. This is real deal microphone. And no one's asking for this, but I'm doing it anyway. And I hope that you bring Okay, and let's just stop right there cuz I'm scrambling my words. Now, okay. So what we're going to do here is have a couple of tapes, a couple of motion picture films. I don't know if you've heard of those. You can't go to the theater anymore, at least not right now. And the, uh, here's a couple of things that I felt a little too, uh, you know, like I didn't have enough to say, uh, or more like I was too nervous to do on the VHS Boy main stream. And I don't know why that is, you know, that's a bunch of insecurity. That's a bunch of bullshit. That's untrue. Doesn't need to be there. So just banish that, and anyhow, I'm so glad to be here with you all, and let's let's hit it, let's hit it. Okay, first, bada bing, bada boom, and that would be Awakenings. Have you heard of this movie? I had never heard of this movie until I found it at the thrift store. This was a while ago. This was probably more than a year ago. Found this puppy for 50 cents, and it's got... Uh, Robert De Niro and Robin Williams. And I know all of you, you smart little geniuses who are cinephiles yourselves. I'm going to just push away a little notification there. No big deal. Yeah, it's like, what is this? Directed by Penny Marshall, who did, um, oh my gosh, not Major League, a league of their own. League in the name, you know, baseball movies got them mixed up understandable anyhow what this is is a quote-unquote true story of a doctor in a psychological ward and that is robin williams character treating a patient who's sort of um locked up mentally at a certain time in his life because of trauma or because of pre-existing mental illness and you know this is a very interesting movie this is 1991 and it is slow burn. It's it's very slow, quiet. It's kind of depressing. It's it's actually quite depressing. And it's got that hazy glow on the lenses. I don't even know what they did. It looks like British TV almost, where it just feels like every room they're shooting in is filled with fog. And um, this is a, a sad, heavy, not happy movie, and in which... Robin Williams, powerhouse comic, powerhouse actor, capable of such a wide range of emotion and expression, is completely underutilized in this. And you know, because it's it's a it's a drama. It's a it's a um, 
just heavy emotional film. And that is not to say that Robin Williams couldn't do drama because he killed it in Goodwill Hunting and in a number of other non comedic roles. So I knew I wasn't getting into him being crazy and bouncing off the walls. But also, it's just like his character is sort of neurotic and quiet and shy, even though he's a genius. And um, he just, it's an, an incredibly tame character uh, based on a real life person. And, and the sort of unf- unfortunate thing about this is that it's like, it could have been played by almost anyone. And that's not shitting on Robin Williams. It's just saying... This is almost like a an enormously generic role that anyone could have filled at the time. Now, Robert De Niro, it's so interesting. I don't know what's going on with Robert De Niro. In one way, it's a gift that he's still alive, that he's still with us, of course. Um, but doing the most random... Uh, far from one another roles that could be imagined. This icon who was in Taxi Driver, Goodfellas, um, and of course I'm forgetting like a thousand other good ones. Anyway, Robert De Niro, we know he's a good actor, but he does Bad Grandpa. He does some dumbass movie with a cat girl. He does just a bunch of silly bullshit and then occasionally has good roles and it's like, man, what are you doing? What are you doing? Will you take anything? I guess. I guess you take anything now. But all that to say, all that to say, he was marvelous in this. Um, now, the the folks of today would get on his case. They would get him in trouble. They would they would cancel him. Whatever. And it, who cares? He's in his seventies or eighties. He's gonna die soon. He doesn't give a shit. You know, cancel him. Um, but he plays a. <clears throat> How do I describe this? A mentally and physically handicapped person. And he, this is a very physical role for him in which he has to embody some sort of spasms going on in the physical form that are not commonly seen and which are, I mean, as I view it, incredibly played he did so well and it's it's painful it's painful this this movie and this role that he does um and so he he was the highlight of the film i would say but is it good it's it's just slow and it's heavy and and um hard to watch in a lot of ways it it has some feelings of uh of uh one flew over the cuckoo's nest that kind of dark pale uh, uh, stagnant mental ward institutional sort of vibe to it that is mostly the the sort of visual sense that you get from the movie and so you know as a as a completist of if you're someone who's going I want to watch everything Robin Williams was ever in I want to see everything De Niro was ever in Okay, like there's there's a few moments that it's very tender, it's very sincere. I'm not saying it's it's poorly done, but it's just a heavy, hard movie to watch. And um, I won't be keeping this VHS because I will never watch it again. But I'm glad I found it because I had never heard of this film, and it's it, you know it didn't do great, um, even though these were two big old stars. Penny Marshall, very substantial, talented director. You know, it just kind of, in a in a sense, got lost to the sands of time. So, sort of an interesting little piece there. Now, what am I going to do next? I've got three in total. Let's do Tequila Sunrise. This was one of the first, this was the first movie I watched when I got to Portland, Oregon. And kind of a... Um, cathartic film to watch because <clears throat> pardon me I do adore Kurt Russell he's so handsome he he gives himself to every role he has ever been in every every role he's ever done Mel Gibson I like Mel Gibson I, I like him as an actor he's a lunatic he's a fucking maniac as a, a, of a person 
Um, and his his life is so wide spanning. He directed the Jesus movie. He was in Mad Max. He he's he was in the Patriot. You know, he's been in a ton of things, both good and bad. And it's it's like, I like the Lethal Weapon movies. I like the Patriot. Actually, I like Mad Max. Mostly the Road Warrior number two. That's the one. That's where it's at. Um, I like Signs. A lot of people shit on Shyamalan. I like Signs a lot. I think it's pretty dang good, actually. Um, and so Mel Gibson, this was before all that, of course. What's interesting about this movie, directed by Robert Town, mm, I've looked up what he's done and I can't remember right now. This is, this was sold and trailered as, uh, you know, marketed as through the trailer as sort of this like, kind of like a cop crime detective drama high action but it really is not it's it's a very slow moving just sort of easy going uh more of a romantic triangle drama with a little hint of crime aspects and a little hint of police not police procedural but just uh like detective work sort of thing so Based upon this cover and having never seen this movie before, it was, uh, you know, a little a little more tame than I would have expected. And M- Michelle Pfeiffer, this poor, sweet gal in 1988, the year that I was born, of course, um, you know, she's, t- she's caught between two men. She's caught between two fellas, two swinging dicks that she's like, you know, I want both of these guys. And the the painful um difficult thing is like you know 1980s 1990s can you portray a woman as anything even relatively close to what a woman is which is (laughs) just far more than a man chasing uh klutz and and that's um so that's that's just a thing in in watching older movies it's like oh my gosh this is so petty and immature in the in the sort of lines that these women are given or in this case this one woman and she's in love with both of them there's a nice ooh soft glow erotic like you know like sweaty skin pounding sex scene in this but what this is mainly okay let's get off of that goodness sakes kurt russell he's a cop mel gibson he's a drug dealer and he's the most squeaky clean uh handsome sort of put together drug dealer that has ever existed and so squeaky clean that probably it's not realistic whatsoever that he ever could have been such a thing it's really great that I'm holding this microphone and didn't set up a, a stand for myself. That would have been the sort of smart way to go. But Tequila Sunrise. Okay, so what I was expecting going into this was more of a, a lethal weapon, die hard, Beverly Hills Cop, another 48 hours. Something in that vein, you know, something with lots of shootouts, like a cold opening, and then a little bit of, a little bit of exposition, and then like another action scene. But no, this is mostly just two men doting over this one woman and her deciding which one she actually loves until uh you know the cop almost gets his man spoiler he doesn't exactly get him but it's all amicable at the end so you know i would say this is almost like a a crime of mismarketing in the sense that they I mean, on the side of the WB sleeve here, it says adult action. This is not an action movie. There's one kind of action-esque sequence at the end where they blow up a boat and there's a little bit of gunfire and stuff, but otherwise this movie is heavily dialogue. It's just a lot of talking. It's, you know, it's kind of sexy. It's kind of sleek. Hey, is it fun? I mean, if you like Kurt Russell, he's, he's great. He kills it. He is fully committed. Mel Gibson, um, somehow he is the everyman that can plug into any role. I don't know if his performance is good or bad. 
but I, I didn't ever, I was not ever taken out of the movie thinking, oh, this is so Mel Gibson. I, I was just like, yeah, this is a guy. Okay. He's a, he's a very clean, handsome drug dealer who has never been caught. Okay. Last one. So maybe, you know, maybe check that out. I'm realizing I'm doing sort of uh, mediocre films, but it it's like, I watch all these because I'm interested in them for one reason or another. You know, just as as sort of like a as just as something that just occurred to me out of nowhere. I don't know if you've ever experienced the um, raspberry lime taste of a fresh ice cold uh, spindrift from the grocery sh- store, and you can find it in in the aisle of your local Target or Kroger or Safeway or Albertsons or King Supers or super savers or um you know whole foods natural grocers and all the all the other places now trader joe's i don't know but any and anyhow and spindrift is the only unsweetened carbonated raspberry lime uh drink with real fruit that tastes better and it's um it has no sugar added and it's certified gluten-free and it has been blessed by a rabbi and so and so you know just incidentally um Spindrift, and that's is a is a brand of soda that you can buy. You have the option to buy it or to not buy it, but go ahead and buy it and see what happens and see if you're, you know, okay. Last film made made the f- now now okay. Here's where I'm showing my ass because I don't know if this was the first film by John Favreau or not. It might have been his second. Now I know he was in Swingers. Did he direct that? I don't think he did. Good thing I looked this up before I started recording. Made. I had never seen this either, of course. I was excited to find it on VHS um, from 2001, kind of nearing the end of the, the VHS era there. John Favreau. He gets... I've, I've had some friends shit on him who think he's now just a, a, a slave to Disney who is just a enormously wealthy guy who will go direct dopey Disney remakes. Maybe he is. I don't know. I liked Iron Man uh, 1 and 2, right? Did he direct both? I don't know. I like Elf. Elf is incredible. How do you make a modern Christmas classic in the 2000s? Nothing else really has endured except Love Actually would probably be about the only other Christmas movie made in the 2000s that has endured and that hasn't become just some piece of shit on the Hallmark streaming channel graveyard. Anyhow, made kind of a cute little crime film from 2001. Now, Vince Vaughn and John Favreau were in the movie Swingers, which I've never seen. But right before this, neither one of them were big stars. Um but they had a sort of rapport with each other. And so John Favreau goes on to write this, direct this, and and he is the lead actor before he got super chubby and got a goatee and got his big frizzy gray hair and started directing pretend animals in Disney movies. Now, I had wanted to see this for a long time because I love crime movies. I, um, I like Vince Vaughn. He's silly, right? I my first memory of Vince Vaughn is is Jurassic World or uh, Jurassic Park, The Lost World, right? Where he is just sort of a dingus who flirts with Julianne Moore. But I like Vince Vaughn. Uh Brawl in Cell Block 99. I like him in True Detective season 2. There is something else substantially he was in, I'm forgetting, doesn't matter. Anyway, made. Yeah, this is kind of like a kind of like a movie that could have only existed in the early 2000s when we were still so innocent and young and naive to believe that the world was a safe enough place to tell a story like this. And you know, I have an affinity for this sort of thing because the the short film I made, Cordial Kill, it's two guys riding around in a car. You know, a couple of crime guys, a couple of crime idiots, a couple of guys who are dummies and in a world that they don't fully understand. That's sort of what this is in a way. 
a much more nuanced way. So it's, uh, yeah, there was, there was some spiritual influence without me even realizing it. But yeah, this is fun. Peter Falk is in it of Columbo fame, and he is so good as a intimidating um, crime lord. But, you know, the crime lord is a touchy role, not touchy, but a difficult one to not just be copying Brando in The Godfather. How do you make it your own and still be intimidating and still uh, um, express that you have a sense of power that you're bringing to that? And Peter Fogg absolutely does. And he doesn't seem like Columbo. He's, you know, not the typecasting thing. He makes it his own. And I, I loved it. Loved seeing him in this. Uh, Sean P. Diddy Combs. Ho- ho- I always want to say Holmes. It's Combs. Sean Combs. Sorry, P. Diddy. You know, since he's watching this. Um, this is fun. It's cute. Vince Vaughn always has his foot in his mouth. Um, John Favreau is sort of the voice of reason. He's our clear protagonist. He is dating a hooker and is kind of... Oh, okay, okay, hold on. He's dating a uh, an, an adult dancer? An erotic dancer? What would you call that? She... A hooker is unfair. Pardon me for that. She doesn't sleep with men for money. She um, shakes her ass in their face for money, and he makes sure that they don't get too handsy. Okay? So, you know, again, anyhow. Um, but this is cute. Peter Falk kind of is, is giving them one last chance to go prove themselves, and Vince Vaughn is like the the, the guy that... Favreau is vouching for, and he's like, hey, he's all right. He's, he's good. He's with me. He, you know, I trust him. And then Vince Vaughn messes everything up. It's, um, it's not top notch as far as crime films go, but you can see there's a certain sincerity to this and there's some great moments. And, um, I liked it. Yeah. It's cute. It's pretty innocent. It's harmless. It's it's so seeded in the early two thousands. It's it's laid on so thick. So for that reason, you know, it's it's fine if you like this sort of thing, then you will likely enjoy it. And that brings us somehow to the end of three motion motion pictures that I talked for twenty two minutes about. Anyway, so grateful for you all. If you watch to the end of this, oh my gosh. Wow, you're you're a real, you know, trooper. Um, yeah, COVID is still happening. The election is coming up. This is fucking horrifying. Um, but it does not have to be. It doesn't have to be horrifying. It doesn't have to be all dire darkness, despair. What other D words are in there? You know, Dattelscar Galactica, I think. And that's kind of a cute little Office reference there. If you've ever seen a tiny little indie show called The Office. We're going to be okay. It may get harder from here. It may get um, more bleak. People are very angry, worked up. It feels so polarized. And um, yeah, people are upset. There's, I mean, I'm in Portland this last weekend. There were a bunch of proud boys rallying together. And that kind of didn't go as well as they thought it would. But you know, these are these are a bunch of of toxic men with machine guns who think that America is good and that Trump is their savior. Um, pushing around Black Lives Matter protesters or or punching them and pushing them to the granite. Um, I know it's it's fucking nuts. There's a deadly disease that we cannot see. Um, I know you guys are going through it too. And, you know, it, it, it's not this bullshit, um, well-wishing, naive, everything's going to be fine. It's like, you must trust that humanity has been through these sort of long phases already. And this is just the one for us. 
and it sucks to live through. But the more that you can connect with what you love to do, with what reminds you of who you are, with what connects you with other people, that is for the best. That will give you a little golden charge in the center of your chest to restore you and remind you who you are. You're still alive. This shit ain't over yet. You know, COVID can suck our dicks. You know, it's going to be all right. But I'm sorry if you have been in despair or felt troubled or have suffered or or had people sick or dead around you. Um, Weird capstone to put on this VHS video. No, it's not weird. It's actually exactly right. Anyway, I know. I'm going through it too. I can get on here and be silly and goof around, but it's like, hell yeah, man. I'm scared to death as well, and it takes everything I have to just trust that this is going to be all right. But um, I am grateful for all of you, and thank you for watching and listening to this. Thank you for being here. And hold on to everything good and all of the dark, despairing, cloudy shit. You don't need to hold it. You don't have to identify with that. You don't have to think that 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 is what defines your life. It doesn't. Things are things are heavy and hard. And it is going to be okay. Take a breath. Take a lot of breaths. All right. Thank you all. I'll stop there.